Hey folks, this is a response video to Dave's uh, video that he did back in June on one of the multi-tools that he picked up for 25 cents. Wow, great price. Um, I know I didn't pay that uh, small of a price for mine. I usually get my knives at a really good price like that, but I was very attracted to this knife. I've, I've actually owned this knife for a good, probably a good two years, two to three years now. Wonderful knife great for your collection. I'm going to tell, tell you guys a little bit about the history about these, these knives. Um, and Dave mentioned, um, I wrote down some notes from his uh, um, video, and basically Dave's knife is, it was marked with A, Caster and Brothers, which the Brothers would, would have been uh, uh, abbreviated. Uh, New York, uh, New York written full length, and why is that important? I don't know if, from what I'm understanding is he didn't really go into that, but it, when you're looking at a tang stamp of a knife, that's really important because whether something was abbreviated or how it was written um, really uh, determines its age. So for instance, if, and we can just uh, re remember that these are gonna be uh, abbreviated. Um, so if it says A Caster and Bro Brothers, New York, full length, um, it was manufactured 1876 to 1947. And I'm thinking that his was probably in that time range. And the reason I'm going to say that is mine is made by Victor, which is basically identical to his. And it, it was also made in Germany. Um, mine was manufactured between 1907 and 1913. Okay, he was quoting uh, his age area in the 1926 to 1947, which is A. Castor, who did eventually uh, drop the name. Uh, the individual died in a car accident. Uh, all kinds of horrible things happened to his family, and the next thing you know is the brand is named. Uh, Camillus, which everybody knows about. Um, now, another thing that you can look at, um, if it was manufactured between 1926 and 1947, on the back of the blade, so for instance on the front of the blade it will say uh, A. Castor Brothers New York, on the back side it will be labeled stainless. All right. If it has that stainless written down on it, then it is and was manufactured between 1926 and 1947. So I hope you guys kind of got all that. So what, what the key is, is the abbreviated New York and the stainless marked on the opposite side of the blades. And that's where you would get that 1926 to 1947 uh, dating period. Uh, why is that important? Because that's history, that's knives. It's kind of fun to see how things work uh, and when they were my, made and uh, when they went out of style. Uh, mine for instance uh, uh, I have a leather package just like Dave's um, on the inside it is actually lined with uh, uh, what looks to be some sort of like old style denier uh, which is nice it really keeps everything put in place it's got two nice snaps. You can't really read it on the outside, but it used to be marked in gold, and it was Victor, C-O-L, slash K-M, Colonial Company, most likely. I have no idea. I didn't even look that up. And uh, this company made toolkits. That's what their primary thing was. So, And they did that in 1907 to 1913. That's when these toolkits were were at their prime and very popular, um, and uh, they so they only manufactured them for a little little while. Um, Germany, just like China nowadays, and America is coming back slowly but surely. Germany was the cheaper way to get knives manufactured over there, and in New York they would import the knives and sell them here. The labor cost in Germany was a, a really good for flipping a good price basically and that's the American way you know let's make some money here 
Um, now let's just scoot this over. I basically have the same things. I have the uh, chisels and uh, one of these chisels is actually marked different. D. Perez, um, Germany. So one of them is actually made from a different company and it's actually shaped a little bit differently. But these blades were typically when they were manufactured um, in the 1900s. You could buy the blades separately. Um, they, most of them are interchangeable as long as it, it had the same hook mechanism um, right here. And the hook mechanism and the way the hook mechanism works is, and this nice half stop, is it basically snaps into the knife and it rotates in. Okay, and it's in there. It's in there really nicely. Um, this method was actually the cheaper of the two methods. So the knives that flip in like this, these were the less desirable of the utility knives. The more popular type were the actual ones that actually get slid in and lock in place. And the reason being is, if for some reason you were working and your knife pushed to a certain side, it, it could still pop out. All right, the ones, the more desirable would be the ones that would be pushed, actually pushed in. Um, in the images down here, for instance, uh, the Napa Touch uh, company, they produced a really nice set that had the push type. Um, but typically, back in the 1900s, these would be sold for 75 cents. So if it took that hook style, you could go to your local hardware store or knife store or salesman, door-to-door -door salesman, and you could purchase different uh, attachments for your uh, knife. The knife handles were made of different materials. This one happens to be of some beautiful hardwood. Um, I mean, just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, real nice hardwood. Um, I'm thinking maybe some oak or something. Uh, but they were made out of, um, and to give him credit, this is a fantastic book to own. This is uh, Levin's Guide to Knives and Their Values, and it is the fourth edition. The fourth edition is the most expensive edition. Typically, this book will cost you in the $100 range. All the other editions do not explain and or have the knife values as explained as in, in this edition, and I really enjoy this edition. I have all the editions, so I'm not saying my edition's the best. I have many of Levin's, Levin's uh, books, but this is definitely the most popular and the one that I enjoy. And the reason why is because you can price any knife that you want in this uh, anything. It goes through fixed blades, hatchets, all kinds of stuff. Matter of fact, that they, they made hatchets and, and uh, all kinds of knives that had this same hooking system. Um, I could read a little bit out of here. I don't want to bore the all get out of you guys. But I, let's go to the price range. A very high price range for this type of knife. We're looking at the 450 range. All right, that's very high. The high range is 300. The medium range is 150. All right, and and I saw some comments in the section. And I'll give him credit here. Let me see what his name was. Uh, Practical Bushcrafter One. He gave Dave's uh, knife a value of about a hundred dollar range. That's that's a pretty accurate assessment of how much that that knife is actually worth. But then again, how much a knife is worth is is not necessarily what this book or what a lot of books will tell you. It's how much someone's willing to pay for it. These these types of tool sets are very difficult to find especially with all their pieces and having them still work the way they're supposed to work so and and having a case that's in really good condition so that's another thing to think about um, so these things are really popular they had all kinds of stuff um, you can see some came with uh, hammers I don't know if you can see that that's in the frame yes it is um, you had some that came with hammers. Um, you had some that had stag handles. And, and that's something to look at. When you look at these price ranges, and this is what's great about this book, is it will tell you what to subtract. For instance, if, the, if, the, if your main knife is made from wood handles, it's telling you to subtract 20% from this value. 
if it's a celluloid or a composite uh, composition handle you're going to sub subtract 35 percent and if it's pressed sheet metal handles you're going to subtract 50 percent um, mint condition adds 75 percent okay so you're going to add 75 percent so if you have something that's an absolute mint condition you're looking at four fifty five six hundred dollars easy if it's worn or one or two tools are missing, you're going to subtract 50%. So that, that's where you're looking at where my kit actually has one extra. Um, and, and these were 75 cents 100 years ago. So you can just imagine that um, everything you got to take everything into account. Odd parts of very high or high value toolkit knives have some value. For example, a single Napatoch handle or blade might be worth fifty to a hundred dollars to a collector trying to fill his incomplete kit so for instance a very popular piece to the kit is the saw and, and an unused saw which this is it's absolutely razor sharp so for instance if someone had a kit that encompassed all this and all he was missing was the saw he would be very much willing to pay a, a premium price just for the saw so that's what makes these things really neat. But a lot of times, I'm not looking to sell this. This is just a neat piece of history. But that value for insurance purposes is important. And documenting that and preserving your knives is really important. Um, the best way to preserve these knives is not keep them in this leather case, by the way. Um, leather uh, cr it collects moisture and all that good stuff. A good thing to do is use yourself some, my new thing is mineral oil. You just take yourself a brush of some sort and you would just basically wipe them down um, and any fingerprints that I put on there have been taken care of by this it'll just clean it right off I'm going to flip them over and yeah, this might be a little bit more information than Dave obviously needs I watched Dave's uh, uh, show on Discovery Network um, and I've been watching his videos before he was even on there he is very knowledgeable I enjoy watching him um, I like his uh, military manner mannerisms um, I enjoy that fun to watch good times and then you'll just slip them in a non acidic bag which you can purchase anywhere and I'll just keep all these nice and preserved in here and these will stay fresh and beautiful for another hundred years if I choose and that's where that goes and I'll keep those separate keep those separate now when it comes to the knife itself it is it doesn't really come in direct contact with the oh and look at this this one actually and I'm telling you these back springs are tough this one actually has like a, it says number 185782. So it's actually got a uh, really cool uh, part number on there. So they made multiple things. And mine also has a stamping of DRGM. And that's standard for German Empire Utility Design. So these were really, these were like the multi tools of the day. You can just lube it up. Uh, it's good for the wood and everything. It's good for your leather. Close her on up, and you can actually, if you want, keep the knife in there. That'll be just fine. And that's how you'll do it. And go uh, get a little preservative on the uh, leather. Nice and good. And that knife is stored and ready to go. Uh, okay, so that's about it. And the last one minute of the video is going to be extremely boring for most people, so you can probably just turn it off right now. But I'm going to read this paragraph to you all if you're more interested. And uh, so here we go. Since the 18th century, if not earlier, specialty cutlers have con continued to include more and more tools and handy size multi blade knives. Of course, the more tools that are included, the more delicate each one has to be. This is why so many older multi blades have broken blades. Uh, they did not stand up to heavy use unfortunately. 
as an alternate way to get a lot of tools into a small knife handle some cutlery companies made tool kit knives okay so these were heavy duty tools all right good stuff a tool kit knife is an ordinary size jackknife handle that resides in a fold up kit with an assortment of sturdy blades and tools at least they are sturdier than the tools in the one piece multi tool blade kits uh, what they're talking about is a basically a knife that would have all the tools uh, in the knife itself um, the tools with a tool kit knife included at a minimum a knife a blade a file a saw and a screwdriver often there were, are several types and sizes of each of these and also a gimlet punch chisel ruler can and bottle openers cork pullers and even a small hammer in some of these kits the tool kit handle has an opening in one end for attaching the tools sometimes there is a second opening in one of the handle for attachment of a gimlet or cork puller sweet all but the highest quality tool kit handles were a permanent spear blade in the end opposite of the opening rather than a detached detachable knife blade. In the best tool kits, each tool pushes straight into the handle, opening the locks rigidly in place. This prevents the tool from shutting on your fingers. So basically, uh, it's a half, it's a, the lack of a half stop it is actually a firm tool. Modern knife, axe, hunting knife sets, and 18th century changeable blade carving knives use the same mechanism. Cheaper kits do not have this feature. They have a fixed pivot pin in the open end of the handle while each tool has a hooked tang. The tang is hooked on the pin and the tool is pivoted into place. Tools in this type of knife usually do not lock. Okay, so that's basically what I have right there, the cheaper of the two. Um, and that's what Dave has also. I'm not saying that it's cheap, but it's just the, it, back then it was the less desirable of the two to own. So I hope this was comprehensive enough for you. Um, fantastic find that he had. Uh, you can find they're getting more and more rare, more and more difficult to find, and it, you're just lucky to have one. Um, enjoy it, preserve it, put it on display. It's you know because if you want to use a tool, go ahead and use a tool. But it is just a fantastic uh, kit to own and heirloom that you can pass on to your uh, children. Uh, peace. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Long, but uh, I thought it was well worth it. Take it easy.